For over 40 years, I've been traveling around the world reporting on history, culture, and tourist attractions. Invariably, I would end up visiting the famous museums. Anyone who has ever been to Taiwan eventually ends up in the National Palace Museum. When I first visited the museum in the early 80s, there were very few tourists. Today, it is the most visited tourist site in the nation. There are tourists from Europe, Africa, North and South America, and hundreds of thousands of Chinese tourists from the mainland who come over to see their artistic heritage. The museum was built in Taipei, Taiwan by the government of the Republic of China in 1965. The architectural style is based on the traditional Chinese palace. Four stories, green tile roofs with yellow ridges. The primary objective was to protect and preserve over 650,000 objects that represent 8,000 years of Chinese history. With the exception of portraits, most traditional Chinese art shows giant landscapes inhabited by teeny people. The artists wanted to illustrate the point that people are insignificant in comparison to nature and its forces. The museum is an important destination for many tourists, but one of its primary objectives is to give young Taiwanese a sense of their artistic heritage, to inspire an appreciation of Chinese art. And it's almost impossible to get through Paris without someone taking you into the Louvre to see the winged victory and the Mona Lisa. My personal favorite in Paris is the Musée d'Orsay. The Gare d'Orsay was a train station built for the 1900 World's Fair. By the early 1950s, however, its platforms were too short for modern trains and the building was scheduled for demolition. But the president of France, Gaspard d'Estaing, understood the value of the structure and turned it into a national museum. A museum filled with the works of the great French Impressionists. French Impressionism got started in the late 1800s and early 1900s when a group of painters in Paris got fed up with the traditional subjects of French painting. They'd had enough of religion and mythology and history. They wanted something new. During the late 1860s, Claude Monet began concentrating on the effects of light and color. The subject matter of the painting, the depth and the perspective became less important. Surface pattern became more important. The Impressionists did all of their paintings outside while looking at their subject, as opposed to the conventional practice of painting in a studio. Today, the Musée d'Orsay presents the works of the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, including Monet, Manet, Pizarro, Degas, Cézanne, Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec, and Van Gogh, artists who freed Western painting from thousands of years of tradition. And uh, you see it in, especially in the 1950s, and that's a very typical American one with this. But I also look for museums that were virtually unknown to the average traveler, like the Museum of Women's Handbags in Amsterdam. During the last few years, I became aware of the extraordinary amount of art that has been stolen from many of the world's most important museums and private galleries. And almost all of it is still missing. A stolen work of art is a missing piece of our history, and we need to get these works back where they belong, where we can see them. I began to wonder what a television program would look like if its primary objective was to get back these works. Here's what I came up with. Each year, over $6 billion worth of art and antiques are stolen, and much of it is used by organized crime to fund drug deals, arms sales, and terrorists. And tens of millions of dollars of reward money is waiting to be claimed. A stolen work of art is a stolen piece of our history. In March of 1990, Johannes Vermeer's concert was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. 
The Vermeer was part of a $300 million theft and considered the most valuable painting ever stolen. There's a $5 million reward. The Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam has the most extensive collection of his works. In December of 2002, Van Gogh's view of the sea and congregation leaving the Reformed Church were taken from the museum. The total value of the two works is $30 million. There's a $150,000 reward. Art cops will tell you what's missing, why these objects are an important part of our history, why they're worth a fortune, and what you can do to help find them and earn the reward. Erika Marini was born in Vienna in 1908. By the age of five, she was considered a major talent. At 16, she was booked for a national concert tour in the United States. She's considered one of the greatest violinists of the 20th century. Her instrument of choice was a Stradivarius violin that was made in 1727. During the fall of 1995, at the age of 91, while Erica was being treated at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital, someone entered her apartment and stole the violin. At the time, it was valued at three and a half million dollars. Today, it's probably worth eight million. The thief also took Erica's musical scores, which contained her notes. The New York Police Department ran down the leads. The FBI was called in. Interpol was put on alert. A few days later, Erica died without being told of the theft. Fifteen years later, it's a closed case and mostly forgotten. But not by us. We want it back. First question, what makes a violin worth eight million bucks? The guy to ask is Joshua Bell. He's a world-famous Grammy Award-winning violinist who also owns a Stradivarius. You can find a modern violin that will play loud and sound good in Carnegie Hall, you know, to the back of the hall, that's, that's fine. But when you're trying to get the nuance and the color in a piece like the Franck Sonata, there's nothing like a Strad. It's like a, being a painter and being given thousands of colors to choose from to get the shading just right, as opposed to three or four colors. And you, you can be a much greater artist as a painter with that at your fingertips. As a musician, you feel the same way. It opens up whole worlds of sound and nuance, which you can then apply to the music. There's so many things that make a, an old Italian instrument. It's the only thing I can even think of that that old, I mean, this is 300 years old, that, that is as useful 300 years later. I can't think of an example anywhere of something that's still better than anything that you can make today. And I think a Stradivarius violin is really the, one of the great achievements of, of a human being in, in history. Chris Marinello is the executive director for the Art Loss Register which is the largest private database for stolen art. In addition to keeping the database, they also search for missing works. They check out major auction houses. They see what's happening online. They go to the important art fairs. At $75 million then, are we all done? I'm happy to wait. I asked Chris Marinello if he had any idea where the Stradivarius might be. It's really hard to, to surmise uh, who would have a Stradivarius uh, lying around. It's a little different than a picture that you put on the wall and, and look at. Um, I, we think that there might be some gang somewhere just holding on to it, hoping that one day the time will be right to sell it. We're finding that art is taking a longer time to surface. Uh, thieves might just be holding on to it. Dorit Strauss is the worldwide fine arts manager for the Chubb Insurance Company. One of the theories that I heard that it was an inside job because everybody knew that she kept her violin in the closet. But uh, that's about all that I can tell you about it. Um, I think if it was ever if it ever surfaced, uh, it would be identifiable because it's a well-known instrument. It has a well-known history. The authorities that would know what it is and it would be recovered. I'm not sure whether it was insured and who the company was that insured it and whether they put up a reward, but it's a sad thing when an instrument like that, it should be played, it should not be just, you know, somewhere. 
For 20 years, Bob Whitman was an undercover agent for the FBI and helped recover over $200 million worth of art. How do you open a cold case like the Stradivarius? You have to go back to the beginning and follow all those leads through again and see what's come up since. The first thing I would do is get the entire investigation, review it all, re-interview all the people that were looked at it before, see who wasn't interviewed, because that's always a situation. Use all the resources that we have today that weren't available at that time. Internet, art net, uh, auction records, and look at all these things that have come up in the past 15 years, 10 years, that weren't available maybe 25 years ago, and use all those forensic uh, techniques to come back and see what else we can come up with. Apparently, it's not that difficult to steal a work of art. The problem is, now that you have something famous and worth millions, how do you sell it? Craigslist? eBay? The internet has been useful to us because it allows us to see what's out there and identify stolen works of art when they come up on the internet because we have information on what's been stolen, we have images sometimes, certainly descriptions and titles. So if somebody tries to sell a stolen work of art on the internet, it is potentially identifiable and that is a good thing. There are elements of the internet also that are traceable so that you can see who has put up the information and trace it back to a source. Again, that's helpful. On the other hand, it allows people to sell things that are stolen quite easily because you can put something up on a list and you can be gone the next day. If you spot the Stradivarius, please get in touch with us. There's a $500,000 reward. During the fall of 2010, the building at 55 Gainsavort Street in Manhattan's Meatpacking District was owned by the family of Robert Romanoff. There's a nightclub in the basement, a cafe on the first floor, and a restaurant on the second floor. There's an elevator that opens directly onto the street, but it's right next to a door that's staffed by a guy who works for the restaurants and the nightclub. The elevator is operated by a key, and only a few people had that key. On Thanksgiving weekend, when Mr. Romanoff was out of town, a gang of crooks broke into his apartment by punching a hole in the wall in a hallway closet. They escaped with over $750,000 worth of art and jewelry, including 10 Warhols and two Lichtensteins. They also took the security camera videotape. Nice touch. The New York Police Department released images of the art, hoping that someone might help solve the crime. Ten of the works were by Andy Warhol, who is often described as the father of pop art. The pop art movement got started in London during the mid-50s and caught on in the United States about five years later. Pop artists would take familiar images from mass culture, advertising, product logos, labels, and comic book art and place them in new and unusual surroundings. Very often, the artist would use mechanical means to reproduce his work. I asked Susana Barcia of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, to show me some of Warhol's work. In my tours, I usually like starting here, Andy Warhol, because I think this is quite different. This is not the Andy Warhol we were used to. I mean, this is what he was doing in the 50s. He was a graphic designer, and he was designing those shoes, you see. But from here, I personally, I can see his, the evolution he's going to have, because I can see the glamour already, and he's going to be obsessed with glamour. I can see the bright colors. I can imagine his assistant helping him to paint, to color, because he had what he called his coloring parties. And as he said, he wanted to be a sort of machine. He wanted to work in every media, cinema, photograph, painting, fashion, music, everything. He thought that everything could be art, and art could become common. When he died in 1987, he left behind a body of work worth billions of dollars. Two other works stolen at the same time were by Roy Lichtenstein. Born to a middle-class working family in New York City in 1923, 
Lichtenstein became one of the most well-known pop artists of the 20th century. Art was a hobby, not a part of his formal education, until he attended the Art Students League. He shifted the focus of his education and went on to get his undergraduate degree in fine arts at Ohio State University. In 1961, Leo Castelli, an influential gallery owner, started showing Lichtenstein's work alongside other pop artists like Warhol. His work explored pop art through the use of hard-edged compositions and tongue-in-cheek humor. Often his paintings looked like comic strips which included the use of bende dots. He died in 1997. These days, his works often sell in the tens of millions of dollars. Those, I believe, will surface soon. Uh, those are the types of things that change hands quickly um, and will end up in the hands of a dealer who will one day check it against the art loss register and they'll pop up um, as a match. We do find insurance claims go up when you have a recession in place. Many cases over the last few years have had circumstances where maybe the gallery had too many art thefts, uh, too many insurance claims, um, you know, and these things are always investigated. Uh, I'd like to review that case because I think it would be interesting to see uh, if we could maybe shake the trees a little bit and pull those paintings, those, those prints. Mostly they were prints, they were not paintings. Yeah, well the fact that where he was located and restaurants and nightclubs above and below and there's a lot of interesting things, yeah. If you have any information about these crimes, please get in touch with us. Chris Marinello at the Art Loss Register is particularly interested in the recovery of three specific works. Since the beginning of the 20th century, the harbored Antibes on the French Riviera has been a playground for the rich and famous. For the last 50 years, it has been home to some of the world's most luxurious private yachts. In 1999, a Saudi billionaire brought his yacht into the harbor to be refurbished. The portrait of Dora Maar, who was Picasso's mistress, hung in the ship's main living room. Normally the picture was connected to a sophisticated alarm system, but because the walls of the room were about to be repainted, the contractor said the painting was in the way and it had to be removed. The plan was to put it in a bank vault, so the painting was taken down and locked temporarily in a different room. Unfortunately, it was more temporary than planned. The room didn't have an alarm system. Hey, nobody's perfect. A few days later, the owner's art expert came on board and the painting was missing. The video surveillance cameras on the docks had been out of action for three months. The police felt it was a theft to order for another private collector. If you have any information about this crime, please get in touch with us. A reward of $1,500,000 is being offered. This is a portrait by the British painter Lucian Freud of Francis Bacon, another British artist. The painting belonged to the Tate Gallery in London. The Tate lent it to the new National Gallery in Berlin. It was hanging on a special wall that had been built just for this exhibition and was therefore not linked to the museum's standard alarm system. In fact, it wasn't linked to any alarm system. In broad daylight, the thief walked into the museum, took the picture off the wall, and thanks to its small size, just walked out with it. It's worth about $2 million, and it hasn't been heard of since. There's a $150,000 reward. In February of 1997, a gallery in Italy was being renovated. One afternoon, while the renovation was taking place, Someone opened a skylight in the roof, dropped a fishing line into the gallery, and hooked the painting off the wall. The work was by the Austrian artist Gustav Klimt. Nice catch. It was worth about $4 million. People realized that it was missing, but they assumed it was in storage. Four days later, they discovered the empty frame on the roof and decided it had been stolen. Brilliant deduction. 
a substantial reward is being offered. One of the disappointing things in art theft is the low recovery rate. Only 14% of the works that are stolen are recovered within 25 years of the date of the original theft. We hope to change that, and there are things that you as a viewer can do to help. What we would like from the public is information. If someone in the public knows of a stolen work of art, has seen something, then it would be good for them to get in touch with us. If they hear of a theft or somebody who's planning to steal something, again, that's the kind of information that it would be useful for us to know. Things in the public domain are quite, you know, quite vulnerable. Whether it's Iraq, we had a tremendous amount of looting from the, from the museums. The public can keep their eyes open. Uh, they can, they can keep, you know, keep looking at what people have in their homes. And if, you know, if you see a Monet in your in your friend's house, if you have a couple of beers with them down the bar, uh, give, give somebody a call. You know, let us know. Uh, basically, they can just keep their eyes open and be uh, be observant and uh, and pay attention. I think you need a sophisticated alarm system that has backup. Um, in a, in a museum, in a, in a large enough museum, there's generator backup if the electricity fails due to a blackout. Um, cell phone communication between the, the museum or the collector's house uh, and an alarm company. They, have, they can then call the cops. Um, you, you need to have redundancies in place. Uh, if you have a large amount of art in your summer house, I suggest you have staff. If you're away from home and you don't have enough alarm and enough redundancy, uh, people will steal your art. It's really, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that depending on the amount of art in your house, and, and you know, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It could be something you really love. Um, you have to protect it. Uh, there is no free lunch in the uh, art theft business. Artcops.com is our website. On it, you will find pictures of each of the works we talk about in this program, the stories of how they were stolen, and the amount of the rewards being offered. If you know anything about their whereabouts, please contact us. Your information will be kept totally confidential. If it leads us to the recovery of any of the objects in our programs, we will help you receive the reward money in complete privacy. We also update our website with new information about the works covered in our programs and about other missing art. Our primary objective is to recover the works of art. A stolen piece of art is a stolen piece of our history. For Art Cops, I'm Bert Wolf. Since this program began broadcasting, a number of the works we talked about have been recovered. For further details, visit artcops.com. And please keep your eyes open for the works that are still missing. For a printed copy of this show, send a stamped envelope and $3 to this address. Please mark envelope with show number. The same information is available free on BertWolf.com. Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. 
Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation.